Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the AI Frontier series, a global collaboration between Reuters Plus and KPMG. I'm your host, Nadira Tudor, and today we'll be exploring how AI is transforming the life sciences sector. Life sciences organisations are leaders in AI adoption, yet many struggle to translate that into consistently high returns. From data integration challenges and regulatory complexities to the evolution toward autonomous AI, the sector faces unique opportunities to reshape everything from drug discovery to patient outcomes. To discuss these challenges and opportunities, I'm delighted to be joined by industry leaders from KPMG and Danaher. Let's start our discussion in Boston with Kristen Pottier, Lead of Global Deal Advisory and Strategy for Healthcare and Life Sciences and Principal and the National Life Sciences Sector Leader for KPMG in the US. Kristen works with the organisations in the industry advising on the commercial and strategic implications of AI transformation. Hello, Kristen. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Nadira. Thank you so much for having me today. Kristen, the KPMG research reveals a fascinating paradox. While 97% of life sciences organizations have achieved operational improvements through AI, only 23% report high return on investment. What's creating this disconnect between adoption and value realization? You see it across all of our sectors, not only in life sciences. The pace of innovation is fast, but as you put innovation into companies and try to realize that return on investment, it takes a little bit of extra time. There's a number of different reasons for this. Number one is just a pure cultural change that needs to happen where all of the people that are trying to incorporate AI into their daily lives get used to it, get excited about it, and take a different way of working in within AI. The second is really thinking about it from, a, again, a purely operational perspective. You may institute AI and start AI in certain parts of the organization, but other parts remain with legacy systems and ways of working. What that results in is a little extra time for our people to get excited about and used to spreading AI across the organization. Organizations using hybrid operating models are twice as likely to achieve high return on investment from AI. How do you help leadership teams restructure their organizations to capture this advantage? Hybrid models tend to be the most flexible, the most exciting that we see in life sciences today and again in any other sector. When we look at a hybrid approach and we look at how the organization is not created either from a matrix side of things or from a functional side, and it's a mishmash of both, <laughs> that allows us to really understand and think about where we wanna go with AI. And not only that, but everybody in that hybrid organization is much more flexible and aware that they have to be constantly changing. So therefore, they embrace AI much more easily and they are allowed to generate that return much more easily. And how do you help executives balance long-term investments with the pressures for near-term performance that will be coming from boards and investors? Yes, this problem is no different than it was 30 years ago or even 100 years ago. We want to be able to see innovation really come to life. We want to be able to bring it into our life sciences companies and immediately generate return from it, understand patient solutions from it, and bring all of our patients and our investors worldwide the outcomes that they want. However, innovation takes time. And when you really put the excitement of innovation into a legacy organization with all of the different components of that legacy organization already built, you have to be able to have the patience to be able to realize it over a longer term. Life sciences and especially pharmaceutical companies are very used to this with 10, 20 year timelines in R&D going all the way to commercialization. So this is no different than what we're used to and especially in a highly regulated environment, you don't want something that is extremely fast because it puts patients' lives at risk. And so at the end of the day, when you're really seeing what we can do with AI today and the innovation that it can bring today and then in the innovation it can bring tomorrow, a measured approach is something that we see 
and it actually allows us to generate more ROI in the future than we ever would have thought possible. The research projects a massive $44.1 billion generative AI opportunity for life sciences. Where are you seeing the most promising areas for value creation beyond just operational efficiency? Operational efficiency obviously is the base of all of this and really helps us as you think about how complex our healthcare systems are worldwide and as we think about life sciences products, whether they be diagnostics, life sciences tools, or pharmaceuticals coming into the forefront and going into patient care. What we see the most promise on is AI's medical products. So for example, in radiology or in the future in pathology, in any of our diagnostics disciplines where a AI eye can read so much better than a radiology, a radiologist eye, it allows us for efficiencies going into patient care so much quicker. We're also seeing this in a, of course, highly regulated environment of life sciences, tools, services, and equipment. We're seeing a tremendous amount going into clinical trials, um, SOP processing, looking at a number of different documents, either going to the FDA or any other regulatory agencies, and allowing much more efficiency in the read of those documents and of the summary of those documents so that we can move through those processes faster. Again, well beyond operational efficiency here, which we haven't even touched. Kristen, thank you for that strategic foundation. These investment and organizational challenges are clearly just as critical as the technology itself. Now let's go to Seattle, where we're joined by Martin Stumper, Chief Technology and AI Officer at Danaher. Martin leads AI strategy for a company at the forefront of life sciences innovation, spanning diagnostics, biotechnology, and life sciences platforms. Hello, Martin. Thanks for being with us. Hi Nadira, great to be here. Martin, Kristen just outlined the strategic challenges around return on investment. From your operational perspective, when you look at that gap between AI adoption and value realization, what are the most common practical barriers? In my experience, the barriers fall into three categories. The first one is knowing what you need to solve for and really starting with a concrete problem in mind and knowing what success means. So really product market fit. And often we don't have that because of the high expectations and hype on AI, but that's where we need to start. The second barrier that I often see are the technical barriers, which are relatively straightforward to understand, data silos and everything. And then the third problem category, which is a bit more subtle, is the change management. So the human in the loop and making sure people are using AI in the right way, they are trained, they're actually engaging with it. And I think most, in my experience, most failure modes fall into one of those three categories. A majority of organizations cite data, quality, silos and integration as their biggest challenge. In a company like Danaher that spans multiple life sciences platforms, how do you tackle these challenges? Yeah, data and data silos are definitely a challenge that we see quite often. In my mind, there are mainly two things you need to do to get right. One, you need to be intentional about data you're collecting so that you actually have the data. And that starts again with knowing what problem you're trying to solve and what data is important for that. And if in doubt, store the data and you can always process or delete it afterwards. The second one is a bit more complex one and that's how you actually distribute and manage the data in your organization. And that's basically just following good practices about data visibility, data governance, making sure the right people in the right organization know where the data resides and making it connected so that you have a large leverage but also the specificity at the respective teams. How is Danaher approaching the evolution toward more autonomous AI, particularly in areas like research workflows and laboratory operations where precision and reliability are critical? We are seeing many opportunities for applying AI in those really critical areas that require precision and it also really hand-in-hand -hand work with the human and the AI. So one example is in quality control where we can deploy and are deploying uh, computer vision based systems to ensure quality for, for devices or for reagents or so based on things like fill level or things like that. Another area where we're applying AI in a very, um, what I wouldn't say autonomous, but human augmenting way is in designing our molecules with, with new large language models and other techniques that create an idea for a molecule, a design for a molecule in silico and then gets validated in the wet lab. And then the wet lab readout goes into the in silico model again. So you have this feedback cycle of improving a model to cool and designing it very rationally. 
Finally, Martin, where do you see AI transforming rather than just improving life sciences operations? And what applications are you most excited about? So at Dana, we look at AI impact in three different categories. We look at AI's impact on people, so really up-leveling everybody in the day-to-day -day work, which is almost table stakes, but really important one to, to go after. The second one is in business processes. So we see a lot of opportunity and already value in making our business processes more efficient, whether it's legal contract drafting or review, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third one, which is the one I'm actually most excited about, is in building better products. So I just mentioned the example of using machine learning in conjunction with wet lab experiments to design microscopes better. That means we can design them faster, but we can also build better microscopes. So as an example, using AI, we can build messenger RNA that is bet a better product, that is more stable and more expressive and can be shipped to remote parts of the world more cheaply, for instance. And then there's another type of product where we see AI having a real impact, and that's on building better devices. So as an example, when we look at the life sciences sector, we can actually build molecules that provide more information than just the image to the life sciences researcher. It might already equip them with, with more insights about the tumor environment they're, lo they're looking, the type of cell, it might count everything. And similarly in diagnostics, there's a very large opportunity to provide additional clinical data, prognostic data to samples that are being in the, analyzed. And that's clearly the future and where we're working on. Martin, thank you for that perspective on implementation realities. We're obviously looking at a blend of strategic thinking and operational expertise for true success. Thanks for having me. Finally, let's cross to Singapore where Anastasia Miros joins us. Anastasia is Director and Asia Pacific Head of Digital Data and AI and Life Sciences at KPMG, working with organisations across the region on their AI transformation journeys. Hello Anna, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you Nadira, great to be with you here today. Anna, we've heard from Kristen about the strategic investment challenges and from Martin about the operational implementation realities. KPMG's research outlines a three-phase framework for AI maturity, enable, embed and evolve. Given what we've just discussed, where do most life sciences organisations sit today? Yeah, it's a great question, Nadira, but frankly, life sciences organizations are no stranger to AI. If we look at the latest hype cycle, which is all about LLMs focused on Gen AI and Agentic AI, there is a different story to be told. Specifically, in the latest survey, we saw that 92% of life sciences organizations have a clear AI strategy in terms of how they're going to execute AI within their organization. However, these same executives are finding that only one in three are able to actually translate AI into their operations and then realize the intended ROI of their AI investments. And from your Asia Pacific perspective, are you seeing different approaches to AI transformation? Absolutely. AI application is not homogenous across industries, across key players, and nor across markets. We recently did a piece of thought leadership focused on the medical device sector in Asia Pacific, where we interviewed numerous stakeholders across numerous markets within the Asia Pacific region. And although there are very distinct nuances in each of those markets when looking at AI transformation and translation, there were three key themes that emerged that were common. Firstly, access. How do you ensure that AI is accessible and it is equitable in access across key markets? The second is capability. How do you ensure the right skills and talent? How do you ensure representative data for your specific market when training such models? How do you ensure there is the infrastructure available to even deploy and utilize AI in these markets? And the final is T for trust, which is really how do you look at potentially regulatory harmonization, where it is very distinct in terms of how each market is regulating AI. The same can be said for privacy and fair use of data, as well as ethical principles. 
So many important questions there, and the report highlights exciting possibilities like AI-integrated clinical trials and ecosystem collaboration between biopharma, medtech and digital health. As organisations move toward this more mature phase, what advice would you give to executives planning their AI strategies for the years to come? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's really three no-regrets moves, whether you're an AI optimist or an AI pessimist. The first one is about data. We've seen and it's well known that data enables AI. However, AI can also enable data. For example, previously cumbersome data governance and data quality practices can now be accelerated and matured with the use of AI. This then becomes a feedback loop where Data equality is improving to improve AI, and AI itself is improving the data which then feeds into AI. The second point is about focus. So we see two approaches common in industry at the moment. Either there's a mandate from shareholders or board members that an organisation must do AI, but there isn't a clear execution roadmap to turn strategy into reality. Or on the flip side, we see the approach of mass crowdsourcing of initiatives and AI MVPs without instead focusing on a few key areas to affect material change and therefore get that ROI that we touched on earlier. And the final point is around capability. AI is all well and good if you can translate it and productionize it, but how do you ensure and invest in developing organizational capability so that AI can be sustained in an organization? We've all seen and worked in organizations that had the best intentions and deployed technology only to find it's not maintained, not operational and never improved. Anna, thank you very much for that forward-looking perspective. And thank you to all our guests today, Kristin, Martin and Anna. It's clear that while life sciences organisations have made significant progress in AI adoption, the path forward requires strategic investment, practical implementation and a clear framework for organisational evolution. Join us next time for another deep dive into how AI is reshaping tomorrow's business landscape. Thank you.